I'm Joe Devine and welcome to the TIFO Football Podcast. Today, I was joined by Nick Miller, who was the writer of the scripts of two recent videos that we've put out on our YouTube channel. The first was about Emil Heskey, and the second, on Tony Adams. So today, we spoke about both players. With Heskey, we spoke about the frankly unfair perception of him as a rubbish footballer. And with Tony Adams, we talked more generally about his career, and there's a little dose of Brian Clough in there as well. Also, this week's episode of This Football Life podcast saw the great Viv Anderson as Josh's guest. Viv was, of course, the first black player to play for the England senior international team. Viv talks a little bit about that, and also a bit about how that's always the first thing people mention about him. So that episode is up on YouTube as we speak. It's also on iTunes and SoundCloud. Thank you so much to everyone who's showed their support by listening and subscribing after the first few episodes were released. We really appreciate your continued support, so if you haven't done that and you're interested in listening, please do go and check it out. The episodes are really high quality in terms of the content, and Josh has got a whole host of really exciting guests lined up, so don't miss out on that. Anyway, thanks for downloading this podcast. If you enjoy it, please give us a like. I don't know if it's a like on SoundCloud. Give us a heart. Click the heart button. Uh, Or if you're on iTunes, uh, please leave us a rating and a review. That really helps. Or anything else, just tell your friends, tell your parents, uh, tell everyone you know, TIFO Football Podcast. Um, Thanks very much, and I'll see you again next week. As you point out in the video, Nick, we're reminded of the general attitude towards Emil Heskey in a song commemorating England's 5-1 victory over Germany when they played under Sven Goran Eriksson, in which the fans sing 5-1 and even Heskey scored. Uh, And I just wondered if you think maybe it's a a lack of understanding of Heskey's role and his overall contribution to the team that has led to that criticism, or what is it exactly that, that led to people thinking that he's rubbish? Well, uh, I mean, I think it's quite easy for us to uh, sort of misunderstand the way that a lot of fans kind of enjoy and watch football. It's kind of it's not on a, it's not an analytical exercise. It's kind of escapism, and you, you know, uh, sometimes and I'm aware this is this may well sound incredibly patronising, but the kind of the uh, intricacies of things aren't very understandably uh, aren't always kind of apparent. I think. Um, yeah. I think we're going to discuss shortly that his he, he he looks like an awkward, fairly awkward man. He's obviously you know he's obviously very big. Um, he has a sort of slightly lumbering, or he had a slightly sort of lumbering running style. So I think it's quite easy to um, to to uh, you know given those first impressions to for then for that then to stick, um, and. Uh, it's it's probably he he probably kind of uh, in this respect anyway he's probably suffered from being in that England team because when he, when he was in the, the the team it was kind of the the first time anyway um, he it was sort of that start of that kind of golden generation era um, Beckham and Owen and Gerrard Ferdinand and then later on Ashley Cole and John Terry and Frank Lampard were all on the team so. Unless you are kind of you know a, a, a player who is winning the league every season and winning Champions Leagues and so on, you you probably are going to suffer by comparison to some of those players. So yeah. I think that's 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 certainly a factor. And then uh, you know, of course, there's, there, there is a possibility that plenty of people honestly just didn't th- didn't rate him, didn't think he was a very good player, which is you know, obviously fair enough. Uh, Obviously, I don't agree. Uh, I think he was a kind of underappreciated player for England, but, you know, <laughs> game of opinions, isn't it? Yeah. I was interested in what you said about the, the lack of inter- uh, intricacy in, in the way that lots of people watch the game. I don't think that's patronising at all, actually. I think that's more uh, a critique of, of a mob, you know, and that makes total sense if you're, particularly if you're in the stadium, which is obviously where the songs are mostly sung, or in pubs, in groups of people. I think when you get people together, uh, their ability to analyze a game as a group or as a mob uh, is severely depleted, and those, you know, they sort of uh, resort to those base narratives. And I think uh, the narrative around Heskey is, is possibly the mo- most interesting thing about about his career. Really, you mentioned there that that we were going to talk about 
uh, his appearance. I think we might jump ahead to do, to do that now because, you know, I, I think um, obviously, you know, he, he had 62 international caps. Uh, you know, he scored over 150 top level goals. That was all mentioned in the video. And despite the criticism that the managers did keep picking him. Um, and so I just wondered, you know, firstly, what was it about his game that persuaded the managers to keep choosing him? And also, I wonder if, again, part of that criticism of him was based on his physical stature. And did that lead to, to him being stereotyped in, in the way that he did? Because that does seem often to happen with bigger players, despite the fact that managers do regularly choose them as well. We see a lot of them, particularly up front, maybe not so much now, but five or ten years ago, that was a very common thing. Yeah, and um, I think when Heskey was in his kind of was in his prime, people still had a kind of very fixed ideas about what certain players should be like. So you know, Heskey, a big guy, people will in English football they say a big centre forward, and I think you know he should be a you know a number nine winning headers all the time and you know holding the ball up, which is you know part part of that. Um, was uh, was was part of uh, Heskey's strength. He wasn't especially good in the air, but he was um, to kind of address the question of why managers kept picking him. He was a very good foil for other players. Obviously, he had a um, had very good partnership with Michael Owen uh, initially initially at Liverpool, and then um, then later on with England, uh, and then. Sort of in the second sort of phase of his England career, he had a very good uh, understanding with Wayne, Wayne Rooney. He provided a kind of um, sort of focal point for someone like Rooney, who at that point was you know in, in very good form and was was uh, playing as a number ten. Um, he provided a, 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 a good kind of foil for players like that to to play off and play with. So and and, and I think that's sort of again feeds into. One of the ideas of why he might be underappreciated because people think striker, you should be scoring goals. And as odd as it seems, he was a striker who, particularly again in that latter period for England, um, whose main role wasn't necessarily to score goals; it was more to sort of, sort of facilitate the players around him that would do the goal scoring. He reminds me a little bit of, of a player who might have played under. Uh, a manager like Jose Mourinho, almost in the sense, you know, in the way that a di- totally different type of player, in Jesse Lingard, uh, although he has scored quite a lot of goals recently, his goal scoring record is, isn't brilliant uh, in his career so far. But as a as a second striker, he makes a lot of runs, and as you say, he facilitates other players. So I suppose maybe we should be, you know, maybe it's not fair to judge him on his goal scoring record if that wasn't his particular strength. Should we be looking for for different metrics by which to evaluate him then? Yeah, and, and the problem is that if you're a striker uh, who whose kind of primary strength isn't goal scoring, then it, it, you're getting into some quite sort of technical areas to judge whether uh, to, to, to you know some quite technical areas to use as metrics, uh, as you say, to judge a player like that. And you know, again, this comes back to the idea that. Some people don't. Uh, a lot of people, most people, in fact, don't watch football in that way. If you, you know, some players, if you're in the middle of a crowd who are singing the five-one, uh, even Heskey scored, and then you kind of pop up with some, you know, fascinating statistics about what uh, he Heskey might actually contribute to the team. <laughs> no one's going to listen to that guy. No, no, no one should listen. I'd love to, that to see guy. you do that in the crowd, though. Yeah, it's. I mean, who, who's, you know, who's going to listen to Buzz Killington that uh, there? It's not. Uh, it's not kind of reasonable to expect anyone to to do that. I mean, it's it's unfair that um, that Heskey, this kind of very good player, if not you know the best that was around at that time, is reduced to a punchline. But you can't. I don't think you can necessarily blame uh, people for sort of uh, underestimating what he contributed to to a team. No, I, I I agree, but I do I do think it's fascinating how uh, in Heskey's case in particular, it's quite an extreme example because it seems that his entire career has been reduced to to that narrative really, and I'm fascinated by the process of that or how that how that actually happens, you know. And I think it does it. I, I think uh, as you say, when you're sort of trying to to examine how how the marble the crowd might. Uh, be analytical when it comes to watching football doesn't really doesn't really work like that. It also reminds me we were talking of his um, physical appearance and his stature before. I think not only does uh, he have to deal with the negative stereotypes that come from being uh, a bigger player and m- maybe more clunky looking as well, but in a different way. I suppose he also has to deal with the 
with the, the the negative stereotypes that come as a part of being black as well. You know, it reminds me of the situation with Yaya Torre about, you know, four or five years ago when he was in his peak for Manchester City. And he was routinely called a beast by people, but, you know, purely because of, of his size, I guess. But he's an incredibly technical player and it's, you know, it seems seems sort of unfair. And I remember when I was, um, well, when, when Heskey was in his peak years, uh, people around me used to call him a donkey all the time, which didn't didn't seem to make any sense. I guess again, it was part of the way that he was maybe looked a little bit clunky when he was playing. And the other thing it reminds me of is um, Graham Lasso and that rumor uh, about his sexuality, which is again is is another example of something which uh, ballooned from from nothing really from him. I remember remember reading that he read the Guardian in the Chelsea dressing room and then that started a joke that he was gay and then that just became something which took over his entire career and I think it's it's fa- fascinating to uh, to to examine how that how that process takes place uh, with Hesse you say it's, it's a little bit more complicated because as you said he 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 wasn't a brilliant goal scorer you know he did have a massive contribution to a team he was a very good player but he wasn't a brilliant goal scorer and he did uh miss you know a number of of obvious chances and that, that's the thing that people like to refer back to I've seen that in the comments of, of the video that we released as well that people say you know yes he was a good player but the reason that people criticized him beca- was because of the sitters that he uh, you know frequently missed obviously every striker misses good chances occasionally I wanted to ask you if you think Heskey missed more or if you think that that existing narrative regarding him made people notice or remember his misses more often. Yeah, I think that's that's definitely a factor. I think it's also a factor that if you kind of um think of the periods of Hesku's career when he was sort of most derided, it was when he was playing for high profile teams. So, you know, mainly Liverpool and, and England. Um the he, he had the, that sort of uh, interesting sort of third phase of his career. Obviously, started out very highly rated when he was at Leicester. Then got the move to Liverpool. He cost a lot of what was then a, a lot of money. It was like eleven billion million pounds, something like that. Eleven um, billion. Yeah, something. I think I think it was something like that. And it, 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 whatever it was, relative to the transfer market at the time, it was a lot of money. Um, but then after he left Liverpool, uh, and then when he moved to, he played for Wigan and, and Aston Villa. He was kind of generally rated much more highly then and I think that's a that's a kind of inevitable consequence of playing for a lower profile club is that you don't um you generally uh, people who don't watch those clubs quite as often won't uh, won't kind of uh they will see the sort of uh the more noteworthy things that a, that a player does um but when they are playing for Liverpool and England everyone's watching those games all the time so if if he does miss a sitter, then you know that will be obviously that will be amplified. Mm. That's a good that's a good point. Actually, I think uh, you know the experience of people who support clubs that aren't winning things, uh, you know, every year and aren't winning games every weekend. They're probably uh, better at taking the positives out of out of the games they do watch or the players that they have. You know, I think uh, as as well, you you also um, get this sort of thing at the bigger clubs with players who are called lazy. I think that's another. Uh, stereotype or a cliche, particularly players like Meza Ozil. You know, he can put in a great shift on a particular game, and still he's known as as a lazy player, which I which I find quite amusing as well. And it's it's, it's the optics of players like that. If you, you you take a look at a player, watch him for five minutes, and then you decide a certain thing. Like Ozil yeah. and Christian Eriksen is the other example that he has a sort of he doesn't have the same same sort of running style as say Song Hyun Min or maybe Deli Ali, but uh not the, it, it, if if you kind of look at the statistics of how much ground those two players that, that those those players covered Ericsson's always up there he's all, he always kind of uh he, he runs an awful lot and i think he gave, he gave an interview uh to the telegraph a couple of years ago where he said uh basically you don't you don't survive in a you know Pochettino Tottenham team if you don't do the running but people still have yeah. that impre- that impression because of um, of, of what he looks like, and I, I guess a similar, a similar sort of thing, um, so, or at least a similar sort of concept might apply to Heskey. You mentioned before about the way that that, that people watch football, um, you know, particularly in the crowd or in a group, for example. I wonder if if Emil Heskey was playing now, do you think that people watch football differently now 
you know, in 2018, let's say, than they did when Heskey was was when it was in his peak or when he was playing with England. Um, because I, you know, there's a lot more uh, by way of, of tactics and and analytics out there. There's a lot more analysis. Match of the day is slightly different in well, a little bit in the way that it tries to treat uh, football. And people do look for you know niches uh, through which to analyze the game. So I wonder if he was playing now, do you think he would be appreciated in a different way, or, or would it be much of the muchness? I think there would be certainly. I think there, there would be more of both extremes, as as you know, um, as the internet has has shown us because there is so much more information and generally fans and whoever else are broadly speaking better informed about these kind of things there'll be more people speaking up for him there'll be more people kind of stating his case and you know arguing for what he does to the team but equally there will be a larger number of people shouting probably very loudly about how terrible he is as well so I think I, I, I don't I actually don't think it would change a huge amount. Um, I think the it'd still be a cult hero. I think it'd, be, it'd probably still be a cult hero, but it, he he might be a kind of slightly more um, kind of intellectual cause celebre kind of thing, where, where people would look at look at analytics or data or something like that and and uh, write you know thoughtful pieces about how what an underappreciated player he is and then that would further antagonize the people who hate him they would shout <laughs> even louder and would all kind of spiral into this mess of just yelling at each other okay let's move on to uh, tony adams uh, who was the subject of uh, the second video that we made that came out last friday um on adams you end the video by describing him as a man who who didn't allow his career to disappear Adams is often remembered for his struggles with alcoholism as well as uh, you know his superb, his superb playing career. But it's true that, that he quit drinking four years before the end of his playing days. So given some of the feats that he achieved prior to that, you know he must have been really an astonishing player to, to not let it slip away. He was a remarkable player. Uh, yeah, he was. Uh, um, but I think the uh, that he could be a remarkable player whilst. Having the the problems that he had and, and drinking to the extent that he did, um, I think that was it, it, that's partly a kind of comment on the edge he played. Lots of he wasn't he, he might have been an extreme, but he certainly wasn't alone. You'll hear the you know all the stories about the the Arsenal drinking clubs. Um, it was a it was a common thing in, in football. So it, it, the, to, to that um, to that extent, it perhaps it was certainly easier for him to to be. Um, be the kind of player he was then than it would be now. He just—I don't think he just—he wouldn't be able to get away with it now. Um, right. But and it's also kind of he, you know, he was a a, a a functioning alcoholic. Lots lots of people do it. People, you know, uh, lawyers, politicians, whoever else will be able to, on the face of it, function as you know members of society. But you know behind closed doors it, 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 it's a completely different story it's just slightly kind of can, almost sort of counterintuitive for that to apply to an athlete because you think that uh, if someone is damaging their body like that with that amount of alcohol they shouldn't be able to perform athletic feats um but you know adams adams clearly did well obviously uh you know the the standard is is very very different now but can you give us a little bit more of an insight into you know the the drinking culture in in English football in in the nineties because it's something it's a little bit before my time and it's something that uh, personally I find it difficult to understand given the levels of uh, you know clinical professionalism that you see from most Premier League players these days. Yeah, it's it's always quite difficult to um, to get a full handle on exactly how it is because there is there's a kind of almost small industry of players who were around uh, you know 25 30 40 years ago to exaggerate these possibly exaggerate all these stories for, for <laughs> right, almost yeah. comic effect they will kind of go oh yeah. you know to romanticize them to rom- yeah to ba- to basically romanticize them stories about players being in the pub 15 minutes before for a game that might you know that might have happened once or twice but it it probably wasn't a you know a, a, a regular occurrence but there was just a kind of uh, a, a, a 
again, this will sound patronising to lots of you know generations of great players that have come before them. But for for a lot of the time, there was a lower standard of professionalism. They just didn't that they re- didn't regard it as um, as particularly harmful if they they went out on a, a Wednesday or a Thursday, got absolutely blotto, and then you know were kind of broadly fine to sweat it out in training on Friday and then. Saturday morning they'd feel fine I don't think uh, even in those days I don't think there they were players who were kind of you know going out and drinking until 3am on a Saturday morning rolling out of bed and then just going straight to the game but um but the the the, the kind of the culture of knocking off training on a Tuesday afternoon going straight to the pub and you know drinking 12 pints or whatever it was that wasn't because I I think there was that idea of because there are two or three days before the game we have to play then that that wasn't a uh, so much of a kind of uh, a a taboo thing they just thought they they thought they could I think I think one of the kind of broad ideas was that training was something to get through and just to keep you ticking over rather than a sort of more intrinsic part of preparation for for games as as I think it is now. I heard um, a a story on uh, the other TIFO football podcast called This Football Life which is hosted by a guy called Josh Neiderweiler. He spoke to Viv Anderson which is the episode that came out last week Um, and Viv uh, told this story uh, about when he played for Brian Clough and Nottingham Forest they were in the European Cup. I think it was a quarter or a semi-final, and they were away on the continent. Um, and he was recalling uh, Clough's alternative tactics, I suppose, to get the players. A lot of the players were very young at the time. Get the players, you know, relaxed ahead of the game, and that was to let them go to the pub and uh, send them back to bed at ten o'clock in the morning after doing a half an hour run or something. And it just struck me as being, you know, so different to uh, the experience that I think most players would uh, would have ahead of a, a massive game like that. These days, Clough, Clough did that. There was a famous story about Clough doing that the before the League Cup final. I think it was nineteen seventy eight. Um, they the, the the team travelled down to Wembley the night uh, you know the, the day before the final. Stayed in the hotel, and he could Clough said he could sense that the players were nervous. So he basically got uh, everyone into a um, like a function room or something in the hotel, filled the tables in front of them with booze, and wouldn't let anyone out until they drunk the lot the, in, including Archie Gemmell who um, was kind of famously for those days stood out as a little bit more kind of professional and didn't really drink very much but he was informed that unless he drank these six pints a mild or whatever the hell was put in front of him then yeah. you know he, 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 he'd be in big trouble the, it, it's it's kind of seen as this great kind of quirky cluffy motivational tactic but for the first half of that game Forest were absolutely awful they were you know it was a team of players with absolutely stinking hangovers and it was kind of it was a it was a, a minor miracle that they kind of recovered in the second half and won the game well, it's a risky tactic isn't it i think you know, speaking of romanticizing the past Brian Clough is probably it has to be the peak of that right absolutely yeah he, he's um there are uh, Clough was one of those characters who was capable of uh, extreme good and extreme sort of ill. Really, he, he I think you know everyone's kind of familiar with his um, with his kind of problems with alcohol, which didn't re- didn't sort of really take over until the very last couple of years of his career. But he was capable of it really being really really cruel and um, using. Tactics like the getting the players leathered before the before a Wembley final that even back then were just kind of on the face of it wildly irresponsible, but because it worked, they were all they were sort of um, you know it was all seen as part of Cluffy's quirky genius. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? I'm working on a writing project at the moment about Justin Fashionu and uh, some of the stuff <laughs> some of the stuff that happened between. Clough and Fashionu, or you know, I suppose some of the things that Brian Clough said to, to Justin Fashionu in the dressing rooms of Nottingham Forest, it's pretty dark. But as you say, uh, you know, I suppose uh, history judges you on your successes, and Brian Clough was incredibly successful, and as you said, uh, at times very quirky too. So uh, I suppose that's how we'll largely remember him. Yeah, the the, the Fashionu stuff is by by a, a long way the kind of low point. He 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 would famously. Uh, his um, the, the thing that people would say about him is that he would very quickly pick up on who 
uh, which players needed the the you know the stereotypical arm around the shoulder and which players would need the kick up the arse. Yeah. But um, with Fashionu, it was much more vicious than that, as as you know, as I'm sure you you've read, uh, and it's it, it, he kind of. You don't. You don't want to say. You know, he 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 ruined him as a player, but he, he fashion. News, I don't think fashion. News confidence was was quite the same after. Well, he didn't some, recover after that. No, after the um, the the treatment he had had from Clough, and it's really. Kind it's of, difficult to lay that all at his door, isn't it? Oh, but, it, you know, there's uh, there's co- coincidence with the timing. Absolutely, and I, I, you know, as as a Forest fan, it really does sort of take the edge off his his uh, his legacy. He's obviously the greatest manager that. Um, that that the Forest have ever had, and the the eighteen years that he was in charge was, you know, this glorious outlier for what would otherwise be a fairly nondescript club in the Midlands. But um, it, that 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 treatment really does kind of. T- uh, is a significant black mark against his name. Well, let's move on to something uh, slightly more positive. Back to Tony Adams. Um, you also point out in the video that uh, although some people expected Arsene Wenger to, to move away from the old school ilk, as you call it, at Arsenal, of which Adams was a key tenant, um, in fact, he didn't. And Adams, alongside the, the rest of the defence, remained you know, a constant fixture. Um, how important were they to the early successes under Wenger. And I ask that because lots of pundits and fans nowadays will point to a lack of players of that type, you know, under under Wenger, and players like Patrick Vieira as well. A lack of steel, they might say. Um, so how important was, was that defence to his early successes? It was obviously crucial. I think that it was a, um, a sort of consequence of Wenger's intelligence and awareness because he knew, he knew very well that, you know, in this very insular world of English football, didn't really know who he was. Um, he had just come from Japan, which uh, you know was regarded. It was obviously seen as a kind of complete footballing um, hinterland. And had he really? I thought he came from Monaco. Well, he 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 won the league with Monaco in eighty seven, I think it was, um, really? uh, and then he went to Japan in the early nineties. Had a couple of years oh. with, uh, I think it was was it Grampus Eight? I think it was Grampus Eight, um, and then came straight because he, he was actually Arsenal wanted to, to bring him in much earlier but he had a contract with, in, in Japan that he had to kind of honour right. so uh, so he came he came straight in there was one of the, the first things Alex Ferguson said about him was that you know this guy who is this guy come here from Japan he doesn't know anything about English football <laughs> but he clearly knew enough about English football to realise that this defence that he had inherited was one of the one of the few things that was was right with that Arsenal team, and he would have been he would have been incredibly foolish to to try and sort of break it up and you know Im- impose some kind of you know fancy foreign style of defending. This was yeah. this was a a kind of solid base on which he could um, he could build the team that he wanted on. Um, why that uh, has kind of I mean, it could be a. This could be an argument to say that uh, one of Wenger's kind of great deficiencies as a coach is that he he doesn't know how to find players like that, how to find players of kind of of great steel. It, certainly in the last ten years or so, because because he inherited this um, this brilliant back four, um, he simply left that in place, and then when, when it came time to for everyone like everyone else to move on he uh, had more problems uh, finding finding similar players um the, you know there are obvious exceptions in that kind of second phase of his his time at arsenal with Vieira and Sol Campbell and I suppose to a lesser extent Ashley Young who was a you know, brilliant player um but certainly in the kind of latter period he hasn't been able to replicate that maybe that's just because there aren't uh, that many players around anymore. It, it, it's, it's probably a wider thing in football rather than just the problem with with Wenger. But um, yeah, he's, he he certainly hasn't been able to replicate it since. Well, Adams played for Arsenal for his entire career, uh, which is over six hundred appearances. We we rarely see one club players anymore, and and I wondered, you know, is it is the obvious reason of money? Is that why we is that why we don't see that? Do you think money is obviously the the probably the biggest factor. 
but uh, I think it's probably a wider point about kind of the globalization of the game. People aren't quite as inf- uh, as afraid of the unknown uh, as they were before, simply because it's not quite as unknown anymore. Yeah, you know, they're, they're not as afraid of going to a, a, a different country or, or, or wherever. Um, but I, I think there's also a much stronger sort of footballing hierarchy uh, these days. Even you know, the, you, people talk about the the, the big six in. Um, uh, in the Premier League at the moment, but if you know Manchester City, as as they have as they have done uh, in the last few years, or even Chelsea, decide that they want Arsenal's best player, and you know uh, the the time of recording, Alexis Sanchez is still a it's still an Arsenal player, but he, by the sounds of it, will probably be moving to to Manchester City. Um, if a club goes. For a certain period of time, without winning the league or even seriously challenging for the league, then players are going to be less sort of maybe less patient about sticking around and, and waiting for something like that to happen, and they will, you know, they will want to move to the team that is going to guarantee them, uh, you know, trophies and you know, and obviously more money. So, uh, you know, uh, Arsenal didn't win the league, and from off the top of my head, didn't massively seriously challenged for the league for the first sort of five or six years that Adams was in was in the team. Um I think if this young centre back who was appointed captain at twenty one or whoever old he was had come through the Arsenal team now and they didn't hadn't won the league for, you know, six years. Uh and then Manchester City came in or, you know, the equivalent <laughs> or Chelsea or, you know, you know, one of the bigger European teams, they'd be off like a shot. How dare you soil the memory of Arsenal and Tony Adams? <laughs> Kind of, yeah. Tony Adams, Tony Adams in the Manchester City team. Imagine that. <laughs> Let's soil it a bit more now, because uh, I want to talk about his managerial career. It wasn't a success. Um, it's interesting, I find, to see when a top-level player and more pertinently as well a captain, as you mentioned, from the age of twenty-one, a natural leader like Adams moves into management and for whatever reason can't hack it. Because I suppose you know he he did it in a time as well where the the impetus to be a technical coach wasn't as strong as it is now you know you you weren't the clubs weren't desperate for a sort of all in one manager and you had you had managers like i mean alex ferguson isn't a bad example of this who was a you know a very very good man motivator and worked with excellent coaches to to achieve what he wanted so i just wonder what it was about tony adams you think that the Made many wasn't a successful manager, or is it? You know, could it be a litany of things? Uh, obviously, it's going to be a, a, quite a few things, and it, we should caveat this by saying it's a, you know it's very difficult to tell why he wasn't a successful coach without viewing it firsthand, which obviously I never have. But my kind of pet theory is that he it's a communication thing. If you listen to Adams talking or you know giving interviews or whatever, he's got quite an eccentric pattern of speech. He um, will often kind of flip from thing to thing when he's you know discussing a certain issue, and he kind of he peppers he, he sort of has the air of like a kind of converted motivational speaker, which might be a kind of consequence of uh, his work with uh, Sporting Chance, the the, uh, clinic that helps uh, footballers and other athletes who have various addictions, Um, which is extremely valid, very helpful, and it has vital and has probably saved lives in that area. But rightly or wrongly, that's like that kind of, um, those kind of patterns of speech and that kind of that kind of language is probably likely to get you laughed at in a in, in a dressing room. So he kind of uh, I think Stuart Pearce is another example of of this. Who of a, he's a manager um, who is kind of constantly fighting against his the, the reputation he had as a player. Uh, like uh, like Pearce Adams was had a reputation as being a very, kind of very kind of no nonsense sort of physical player, but as a manager you you don't want to be seen as just just the guy who shouts at people or kicks someone up in the air you want to be seen as someone who's a little bit more maybe cerebral um and sometimes that you know sometimes that works sometimes people can um sort of subvert the stereotypes that people have about them sometimes it doesn't and possibly with Adams it, he just hasn't managed to do that okay and uh, finally i'm going to end on a question which will be impossible for you to answer nick 
Um, it's very difficult, obviously, to to compare players for obvious reasons. Uh, but where where do you think Adam sits in, in the list of best centre backs in the, in the history of the Premier League? Because you don't always see him appearing in those, um, you know, best best elevens. But presumably he'd he'd be up and around there. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's, it's kind of it's it's a little bit tricky because he was almost a kind of. Um, Holdover from a previous era, he was a kind of very a very different style of centre back to the to the ones that have sort of been uh, successful in the Premier League in the last sort of fifteen years. Obviously, people you know people like um, Rio Ferdinand and even kind of the peak years of someone like Sol Campbell. Um, but as a you know as a as a a organizer of a defense as a, a a pure stopper as a you know a a, a, a a central defender in the kind of traditional mold someone you know comparison being someone like John Terry or maybe even Nemanja Vidic someone like that he's 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 right up there with with all of them it's it's as you say it's almost impossible to compare players from different eras even if they, those eras did kind of did overlap but He's undoubtedly up there with with the best that we've seen in the last kind of last couple of generations. Yeah. Okay, Nick. Thanks very much for for joining us, and uh, hopefully we we'll speak to you again soon. Thank you.